hard uh, uh, to make that uh, collaboration a success. But also, I think if we look at the, the Indian economy today, uh, I think it is, uh, uh, it is in, um, you know, things are in a much better place than they uh, could have been had these important but difficult reforms not been taken, you know, these decisions were not taken uh, at the time they were. So I think it is, uh, it's also uh, an important story about uh, making timely economic reforms, uh, working in partnership with industry, working in partnership with international partners, uh, to drive through important economic reforms. Uh, and I think uh, 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 today's session is just a continuation of these of these efforts to bring uh, new insights, new dialogue, new conversations, uh, and uh, uh, sharing expertise. I think that's really, really uh, all I have to say today, but I wanted to say a huge thanks to, to, to all our experts today. Uh, and uh, uh, it's actually, it, it's a pleasure to be uh, working in partnership with the IBBI on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aluwalia. That was uh, the right context set up for this uh, event today. I would now request uh, Mr. K. R. Sajikumar, Executive Director of IBBI, to address the participants. Thank you. Uh, uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Um, thank you, Mr. Rahul Aluwalia, um, for having you know associated with this kind of a program with IBBI. As you rightly said, this has been uh, in continuation with the partnership we have already had. We have uh, arranged and organized many programs in the past, and I hope that this partnership would continue. Uh, I also thank, uh, you know, Mr. Bahram Vakil uh, and other experts, uh, Mr. Clive Bernard and Mr. Piyush, Mr. Suharsh and Mr. Pulkit uh, for having um, uh, come here. And um, in fact, uh, I thank you for sharing your valuable experience uh, with IBBI and all other stakeholders so that we'll be able to learn from, you know, the mutual experience of all the uh, people, all the uh, persons, all the entities, uh, uh, you know, which are involved in this process. In fact, all of us know that um, the, the the company in distress, the corporate person in distress needs to be, you know, resolved at the earliest, whether it is insolvency resolution or liquidation. It has to culminate, you know, in a shorter period of time. Otherwise, uh, value of the assets would be lost. In fact, uh, if you analyze the, 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 the objective of the code, the insolvency and bankruptcy code, you will find that there is no mention about the liquidation at all because this law, this new Indian law is only talking about insolvency resolution of corporate persons as well as individuals. Of course, this process of uh, uh, resolution of insolvency should be uh, in a time bound manner and the other objective is the maximization of value of assets and also, you know, uh, developing entrepreneurship and, and other things. Of course, that is the reason while dealing with, you know, liquidation and insolvency matter, uh, the NCLAT uh, described the, the various objectives of uh, the code to be uh, insolvency resolution. It also acknowledged the fact that there is no liquidation at all because liquidation is the last resort in, in a process. Uh, uh, we cannot directly liquidate the company. Of course, uh, there is a provision for direct liquida liquidation, but the endeavor of the law, the, the, the jurisprudence that has evolved uh, all uh, e e point to the resolution of insolvency. So insolvency resolution uh, e is considered to be the best uh, you know, medicine for revival of the company. As all of you know that we have uh, in the past tried many things, but we failed. But this law, this new law is trying to help resolution of insolvency. And liquidation process also has undergone many changes, as you know. Uh, it is not uh, that only one process of uh, liquidation is available. In fact, jurisprudence has also evolved that, uh, uh, you know, the, the arrangement and compromise under Section 230 of the Companies Act
trust into surveys. So all these point to the fact that the the options, the various options available to uh, revive the company is to be uh, explored at the very outset. And if that fails, only liquidation should be resorted to. As you know, liquidation is nothing but the death knell of the corporate debtor. Nobody wants the corporate debtor to be liquidator. Nobody wants the, the assets of the corporate debtor to be sold into parcels and pieces and the company is to be dissolved and bound up and then the company's name is struck off from the register uh, of the registrar. So we want the company to be revived for the economic benefit, for the whole benefit of one particular nation, not only really one particular nation, but globally. In fact, we are living in a global village where we'll be able to benefit from the experience of other jurisdictions like the UK. Of course, there may be uh, similarities and disparities, but it is always better to know the processes and procedures adopted by uh, another jurisdiction so that we will be able to learn lessons uh, for ourselves. It is said that only when you share the other's experience, you will be able to know where do you stand and what are the shortcomings, what are the advantages of your process. So I thank uh, the, the UK government for its initiative and all those who have spearheaded for the successful combination of uh, uh, this uh, webinar today. So I wish the, the webinar uh, all uh, uh, the best and I'm sure that the experts would be in a position to you know, discuss and we'll be able to benefit from the, the, what is happening today uh, you know, uh, in this webinar. And uh, once again, I wish the webinar every success and uh, I look forward to further cooperation with the UK government. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. Thanks a lot for those insights and putting the things into perspective. I would like uh, to now invite Mr. Ritesh Kavaria, Executive Director from IVBI to address the participants. Good afternoon, Mr. Rahul Evalwalia, First Secretary from British High Commission. Allied panelist for the webinar today, Mr. Behram Vakil, Mr. Clive, Mr. Piyush, Mr. Suharsh, Mr. Pulkit. Uh, joining from on the webinar, all the professionals, other uh, dignitaries, and uh, even my colleague, Mr. Saji Kumar. As Mr. Saji Kumar has uh, uh, stressed that, uh, uh, emphasized that nearly all the discussion and coverage on the insolvency and bankruptcy code uh, highlight the process of resolution process, which is the first objective of the code and liquidation is normally not much talked about. It is obvious that the objective of the code is to maximize the assets of the corporate debtor and uh, preserving the organization capital of the corporate debtor has to be our logical first preference. Uh, but at least uh, uh, in the initial days, we are bound to see many, many liquidations because we are dealing with legacy cases. And if the enterprise value of the corporate debtor has been lost, uh, in my opinion, liquidation is the only answer left with us. Word over insolvency process uh, help entrepreneurs close down unviable businesses and start up new one. This ensures that the human and economic resources of the country are continuously channelized for efficient uses and thereby increasing the overall productivity of the economy. In our system, we uh, around 2000 cases has been closed till date and of this around 50% have ended in liquidation. One can argue that uh, there are too many liquidations in our pro uh, system, but as I mentioned that uh, we have to bear in mind that these are legacy cases. At least three fourths of them were either in BIFR or um, uh, defunct uh, companies. So even uh, uh, the code was able to resolve 277 companies till September. And of these uh, one, uh, one third were uh, either defunct or BIFR. So this code was able to resolve even uh, those companies which are not uh, functional are all on the deathbed already. So in this process, in our approach, we have uh, trusted on a uh, professional for the uh, 
to resolve, to take responsibility, to uh, um, to sell the assets of the corporate debtor, uh, and then uh, uh, own all the responsibility of the process. Uh, this process has to be market determined, and uh, his fees are also to be market determined. Uh, in this process, we have uh, because we did not have much experience about this process, so we encountered many challenges in the initial days, and we have taken uh, uh, measures uh, swiftly to uh, address them. Some of them are like uh, that we have provided time limit for secure creditors to exercise their right about uh, whether they want to relinquish their security interest or otherwise, so that liquidator is not. Keep uh, kept hanging for uh, their decision. Some uh, liquidity concerns were there with the liquidator, where the CD had absolutely no money. Uh, we provided a regulation so that at least insu financial institutions can provide for some liquidity. Uh, there was no COC to guide uh, liquidator, and sometimes uh, commercial decision uh, in a single uh, liquidator taking commercial decisions for uh, some liquidators were not comfortable. We provided a mechanism for a stakeholder consultation committee. We um, uh, even we reduced the timeline for uh, liquidation process from two year to one year in this uh, uh, in align, alignment with the objectives of the code. Uh, as I told that it is a market determined process and it's uh, the outcome quality of outcome of this process depends on the number of participants that are participating in the market. It must be very easy and economical for stakeholders to participate in the process and towards this we have empaneled a platform for distressed assets and I we expect that the buyer the end of this financial year the services will be available for sale of liquidation assets to liquidators. Recently, we have even uh, uh, launched a discussion paper on a few other issues. One of them important issue is non readily realizable assets and uh, we expect that once these regulations are out, it will help liquidators uh, realize their assets early and uh, the, uh, claims of the stakeholders will be better realized. Uh, we are also taking many advocacy and awareness efforts with various uh, authorities like uh, taking up with uh, the various government agencies and taking advocacy programs with them, writing letters to them. So we are issuing facilitation letters to uh, professionals uh, uh, regarding CIP processes, liquidation processes, avoidance transactions. Uh, but as I told, it's a journey and uh, we, we intend to uh, learn, improve and uh, in this uh, uh, with this deal, we uh, try to look forward to other jurisdiction to embed their best practices. And if we have to look out, there is no better place than UK because their legal framework is quite similar to us. And uh, if we adopt their best practices, it requires least amount of doubt traveling. Us, I am happy that uh, FCO has UK has taken this initiative and uh, extended their series of cooperation for us uh, in the establishment and development of insolvency ecosystem. And uh, I hope that today's in today's session we are going to take up, uh, uh, we are going to see uh, and uh, many practical issues that are bothering our liquidation processes. Nevertheless, uh, I'm not going to take much of your time. I am equally eager to hear our panelists. So let's listen to the panelists and the faculty. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kavaria. Um, so the bottlenecks that you defined uh, that were there in the earlier system as well as the updates rightly summarize why we, we are here to uh, deliberate on this uh, topic, which is becoming of imminent importance now. I would now like to invite uh, Pulkit Gupta, partner EY, to, in, uh, to start the session. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Shivani. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Rahul Aluvalia, Mr. Saji Kumar, and Mr. Kavadia for keynote and welcome address. And also, thank you to IBBI for giving us this opportunity to organize this session. Uh, and uh, thanks to FCO for uh, their support in development of insolvency ecosystem in India. Uh, what we'll do is uh, I will over next five to seven minutes try and share some of the data points on what has happened in the liquidation uh, uh, regime in last four years since the inception of IBC 
and set some context and then uh, we'll invite clive uh, to share his experience and some uh, relevant points uh, for the indian market uh, uh, as they happen in uk and then we'll have a panel session so to start with uh, uh, in in last 4 years since the inception of uh, ibc in december 2016 we have uh, close to uh, uh, 4000 odd uh, cirps which have been initiated and uh, out of those uh, 4000 uh, odd cirps which have been initiated about uh, uh, 1800 odd have been resolved uh, so about uh, uh, about 45% of total cases which have gone into insolvency uh, have resolved and uh, out of those cases which have completed the cirp process about 955 have uh, uh, been uh, Uh, fi- uh, have been filed for liquidation so approximately 24% of overall uh, cirp which has started in 4 years uh, uh, since the inception have gone into liquidation and uh, i would like to highlight one fundamental difference which is there in the indian liquidation regime as compared to uh, some of the uh, other uh, countries and more so in uk in india uh, the way law stands right now there is no provision for filing of insolvent liquidation and this is a topic where with clive would also touch upon uh, but uh, what that basically means is that if a company is uh, uh, in uh, has assets which are less than the liability then they cannot directly file for liquidation because they are insolvent uh, and they will have to compulsorily go through the insolvency process obviously there were valid reasons why uh, the law was drafted like this but uh, uh, there are certain uh, Uh, implication of the way the law is drafted and uh, and that's what we've tried highlighting on this slide so uh, out of the 955 cases uh, which uh, have gone into liquidation about uh, 867 are uh, still ongoing and uh, balance have um, either been dissolved or uh, are, are at a final stage of report being submitted and should be completed soon but the interesting fact to note here is that Uh, of the cases which has gone into liquidation almost half of them uh, did not actually uh, receive uh, any resolution plan so uh, no plan was received uh, and uh, while they were in cirp and eventually they were filed for liquidation and also uh, what uh, what is there on the next slide so sanjana if you can go to the next slide is that uh, from uh, the cases which is which have gone into liquidation uh, it has taken about uh, uh 300 odd days uh, from the date they were admitted into cirp and uh, f- uh, f- to the liquidation order date so they have uh, to be precise they have taken about 312 days uh from the uh, date of initiation of cirp till the liquidation uh, start date so which basically means that if there, were, there since there is no insolvent liquidation provisions uh, in india uh, uh the cirp period taken another 300 days uh, and then the company has gone into uh, liquidation uh on the cases which have gone into liquidation and out, are ongoing uh, about uh, 104 cases have crossed uh, 200 2 years uh, 324 cases are between 1 to 2 years and uh, balance are less than 6 months so uh, a large part of the cases as you see are still under 2 years of uh, of liquidation uh, the claim amount received during this period is uh, uh, a very high number so close to uh, 5 lakh 70000 crores of amount has been received uh, in these cases under liquidation and uh, uh, the liquidation value is roughly about 5% uh, or, or, or on on these cases uh, in terms of cases which are resolved Uh, uh there are about uh, as uh, uh, there are about 180 odd cases which are resolved and uh, those cases uh, uh have resulted into a recovery which is uh, higher than the liquidation value so the cases which are getting resolved uh, uh, are uh, giving a recovery of higher than the liquidation value in in, in the liquidation uh, period so i think so uh, uh, as was highlighted uh, earlier also that lot has happened uh, in the liquidation there are a lot of development uh, based on the market practice uh, ibb has been quite nimble for it to bring in uh, changes as required and uh, because liquidation uh, kind of comes after the cirp process so the focus would uh, uh, 
uh, would be even more in the coming period on the liquidation because effectively for first one year or so there were hardly any liquidation while the CIRP was going on and it's only after the 270 day uh, window was completed on the CIRP cases uh, when we started seeing the um, uh, liquidation wing file. So now going forward, um, uh, there would be more and more uh, focus on liquidation. Lot has already been done in last uh, 12 to 24 months. Lot of relevant changes have already been brought uh, in the regulations or in the act. Uh, uh, there are some key topics which will also be discussed uh, in uh, in the session today, including uh, uh, the sale of going concern, how practically uh, it is done and what are some of the challenges. Uh, the role of uh, resolution professional or the liquidator versus the uh, lender's uh, roles and responsibility. Uh, the charge which are there on the assets under liquidation. How do you uh, 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 take care of them while trying to liquidate the assets? Uh, scheme of arrangements. How, how do you implement a scheme of arrangement uh, during liquidation? And uh, last would uh, be the assets which are attached by uh, various authorities. So we are seeing that assets uh, under liquidation are attached by uh, various authorities. So how do you deal with those assets uh, while you're trying to liquidate them and recover the money for the liquidation estate? So uh, without taking uh, any further time uh, with that background, I would now invite Clive to start uh, uh, his presentation where he would be talking about uh, the UK regime and then we'll get into how uh, can that be uh, replicated uh, to make the India regime uh, more uh, uh, more advanced. So over to you, Clive. Uh. Uh, thank you. Yes, thank you for those introductory remarks. And it's a great pleasure to continue being involved in the ongoing discussion of Indian insolvency regimes. I personally first got involved in 2015 at the kind invitation of Mr. Baram Bakil. Um, and we gave some inputs to the BLRC, as it then was, in relation to the formulation of the IBC. And on that, I worked with um, Alex Aitken, who's part of mine from Hong Kong, who I'll invite to become involved in the panel discussion later. Um, I'm also going to ask my partner, John Chetwood, to give us a short presentation on the nitty gritty of UK insolvency. Uh, and in particular the liquidation process. But let me first just say by way of introduction, um, I absolutely agree with uh, Pulkit's observation that there is a strong contrast between the way things work in the UK and the way things work in India, in that in India you go through, you must go through your CIRP processes first. In the UK, we have a wide range of alternatives, one of which is straight liquidation with no formal resolution process first. Now, I think there is an underlying difference, uh, sort of almost philosophical difference as well, which um, was uh, apparent um, and struck me again when Mr. Raju Kumar made his introduction. The whole um, thrust of the Indian regime, and I fully understand why, is survival of the corporate debtor if it's, all, if it's at all possible. We have a slightly more, um, perhaps uh, cynical, I don't know, uh, approach, which is that we, we've, we focus much more on the, the business rather than the vehicle which runs the business. And so our underlying approach is survival of viable economic entities whether they are continuing to be cloaked in the guise of the corporate debtor or whether they are in a new vehicle. So the, the, the thrust of what we have developed, I mean, we didn't come to this straight away. We developed our insolvency regime from a fundamental uh, root and branch overhaul in 1986. But the way it's developed since then is to say, let's swiftly recycle viable businesses out of distressed situations and let's use liquidation as one but by no means the only tool in order to achieve that. So let me now ask Mr John Chetwood to um, lead us through these few slides 
and um, we'll tell you how it, how the liquidation process works in the UK. John, are you okay with that? That sounds good, Clive, and, and, and thanks to you and to the other speakers for the for the for the in introductions, and I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak to speak to this audience. Um, uh, my name is. is I've mentioned I'm, I'm John Chetwood. I'm a restructuring partner in the uh, London office of Herbert Smith Freehills and the purpose of, of my short 15 minute um, slot today is to give you a sense of how liquidation works over here in in the UK. The, 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 the first slide which you have up on the up on the screen at the moment is essentially setting out the, 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 the broad procedural ways to commence liquidation and the different types of liquidation that we have. So over here, in, for, for largely historic reasons, we distinguish between compulsory liquidation and voluntary liquidation. There's no real magic there. The simple difference is, frankly, that compulsory liquidation involves an order of the court and voluntary liquidation either involves the creditors, um, the creditors, you know, driving the process without a court order or if the business is solvent the shareholders driving the process so when you talk about english liquidation you may hear you know, the terms like compulsory liquidation or a, a member's voluntary liquidation or a creditor's voluntary liquidation clive made a very interesting observation which is english law has traditionally focused on how do you how do you um, how do you rescue the, the the business even if that is not necessarily meaning rescuing the the company as a as a going concern itself? So the the point I would just draw out at this stage is that whilst this is a presentation on liquidation, I view sort of the essence of what is a liquidation. It's very simple, really. It is realizing assets and distributing them to creditors. That's the sole process. And actually, whilst this is a talk about liquidation, the English law insolvency processes are a little bit more flexible than they might seem. And it is possible that in an English law administration, which some of you may be familiar with, you can actually have a, a process which commercially is very similar to what some liquidations look like. So the way we view things is liquidation is certainly a terminal procedure. It is going to result in the realization of assets and distribution to creditors, but it is also possible to do that in a number of other mechanisms that may or may not um, involve an actual formal liquidation. So what I'm going to come on to talk to is uh, we've, we've included quite a bit of detail on the slides as to how you go about commencing the various processes and, and broadly how they operate. I'm going to talk through those in a little bit of detail and then try and come on to sort of the, the, the real commercial thrust as to what does a liquidator look to do in most of the English processes. When we're talking about compulsory liquidation, I mean, it's a really interesting time in the market at the moment because the UK, like many other jurisdictions, has as part of its response to COVID effectively switched off compulsory liquidation. How do you do that? Well, you withdraw, you remove the ability of creditors to issue a winding up petition. So how do you start formally the process um, to wind up a company using the compulsory liquidation route? Well, it's typically a creditor with an unpaid liability and unpaid debt can issue a petition to the court requiring that that amount is paid. If there's a genuine dispute as to whether that debt is paid, then this is not the appropriate route and the company, the debtor may make an application to set aside. But in very simple terms, this is a this is designed to be a straightforward mechanism for a creditor with, a, with an outstanding due amount can present a winding up petition to court and when he presents that winding up petition to court, a hearing date will be fixed and the creditor then has to do a couple of things. The creditor has to serve the winding up petition on the company and then the winding up petition is presented, uh, is, is notified in the Gazette. The Gazette is a, a formal publication in London with, um, with various statutory notices for those of you who aren't familiar with how it operates. Now what's the effect of all of this? Well, 
Um, most of the big clearing banks monitor the presentation of winding up petitions in the Gazette. And so once a winding up petition is presented, that can often result in very draconian consequences for the company, things like bank accounts being frozen um, and other uh, pretty terminal events. So for a number of reasons, a, the presentation of a winding up petition is a very serious event. For that reason, the way the English law process works is that creditors, uh, a petitioning creditor, must serve the, 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 the winding up petition on the company within a certain number of days before the hearing. Um, but then there is a, a restriction on when that petition is presented effectively to allow some negotiation between the company and the petitioning creditor. So it's a fairly flexible route. Um, when you actually you know, go through it, you will end up at a, at a winding up list in the um, in the court and they will have you know, maybe 200 winding up petitions that most of which are rattled through fairly quickly. Um, but if there's a contentious matter, then you are into a proper court process as to whether or not the winding up petition ought to be made. Um, very briefly, the grounds for liquidation, it's, it's essentially broadly two things. The company is insolvent, either on a cash flow or a balance sheet basis. It has not, you know, one of the, 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 the key practical protections for creditors is um, they can issue what's known as a statutory demand prior to this process. The effect of that is it's 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 basically viewed as evidence that the company is insolvent if it has, if it has not paid that statutory demand within 21 days. It's also possible to wind up companies on a just and equitable basis. Typically, you only see that for deadlocked joint venture companies, which you know, no agreement can be reached. Therefore, they you know, it, it is it is an established mechanism that the court will effectively say it's just inequitable in the circumstances to wind up this business. What happens when the winding up order is made? Well, under English law, um, the default position is that the official receiver becomes the liquidator. The Secretary of State can either then choose to appoint a third party office holder or the creditors can indeed appoint an office holder. In the larger restructurings, or not restructurings here, these are liquidations, but in the larger liquidations, it's fairly typical for third party insolvency practitioners to be appointed because they will have um, the bandwidth uh, and the, frankly, the, the number of personnel required for those large jobs to run those processes. What I think is a really interesting feature of the market over here um, is as restructuring as a concept has developed, it is now more common than it used to be, say five, ten years ago, that companies will try everything they can to restructure. So using a scheme of arrangement, restructuring plan, whatever it might be, and they will essentially negotiate for as long as possible with their creditors. And it is becoming a bit of a feature that the liquidity is the thing that can often call time on those negotiations. So let's take examples of Thomas Cook or Carillion. Ultimately there you found the thing that forced the companies to go into a process was the liquidity shortfall, like they ran out of cash. And at that point, there was no other option than to appoint um, the official receiver as liquidator because there was no um, cash left in the company and therefore no third party office holder would ultimately take the appointment. In Carillion, another interesting feature is that was, for those of you who aren't familiar with that case, that involved essentially the provision of services to a number of schools and, and, and a number of sort of public sector type um, outfits. That was the nature of Carillion's business. So one of the advantages of the official receiver doing the job was that they could pursue more of a politically driven approach of keeping certain essential services open whereas a typical liquidator probably would have found it much more difficult to do that, even with um, sensible funding arrangements in place. I might move on fairly quickly from this slide, because effectively what, what happens when a winding up order is made, it is terminal. Um, it, it is essentially going to be the end, of the end of the line for the company. So you have things like termination of employment contracts, you have a stay on proceedings, 
um, and you have sort of various mechanisms that kick into effect. For example, the directors preparing a statement of affairs and the liquidators carrying out their role. I think on the next slide, we, we just outline some of the additional powers that an office holder will have. Um, essentially, these are to review previous transactions, to work out is there anything here which ought to be challenged broadly because there is some impropriety. Um, when you look at the detail of these provisions, they are very specific. And um, looking at these, when you actually go through and try and bring these types of claims, they are often complex, expensive claims to bring. But the, the way the system works over here is that often if there is a good claim, a liquidator ought to be able to find a mechanism to bring that claim, whether it's through the provision of external third party funding or the broad support of the, the, the creditors committee or secured creditors in order to in order to bring those types of those types of claims. Um, on to the next slide. This should hopefully be um, there should be nothing unfamiliar with this. This is essentially what does the distribution process look like? How are assets distributed? And we just put up, up on the slide the, the, the statutory waterfall, if you will, in the English process. And hopefully there shouldn't be anything particularly surprising here. But the, the, the key thing with this, I think, is if you look at what is the liquidator going to actually do when he's he or she is selling the assets and selling the assets and then distributing the proceeds. Well, the key thing for the insolvency practitioner is that they'll be very mindful of who is the creditor most affected by what they're doing and that then drives how they will um, design their strategy and how they will sort of get comfortable that the approach they're taking is the right one and robust one in the circumstances. To give you an example, if the value breaks entirely in the secured debt, it is often the case that the insolvency practitioner will work relatively closely with the secured creditor to ensure they are comfortable with the process being taken to sell the various assets, how they're going about doing that. The reason that works in practice over here is that often, you know, frankly, they are the, the creditor most likely to sue the office holder if they get the process wrong. So we actually have quite a collaborative process between the, the particular affected creditors and the office holder. The office holder obviously has independent duties as an officer of the court and a licensed insolvency practitioner, but it's actually a much more, the way the process has grown up organically is there is a much close, there's a very close relationship between the liquidators and the secured creditors, and it will be more collaborative in designing the solution. Where the value, where, where you don't have that sort of one key secured creditor and you instead have lots of unsecured creditors, then in those circumstances, often the, the views of the creditors committee will be um, will be rather, rather important. One final point to flag here um, is this distribution process works very well for 99% of the liquidations you may find. One of the features of English law is that if you have some particularly challenging sets of liabilities or um, or you have some particularly complex intragroup processes or you have novel questions of law for example those that arose on the very complex Lehman waterfall um, issues for those of you who don't know that was around complexities in the distribution of assets where uh, a company in administration was actually solvent at the end of the day in those situations, we can actually use either company voluntary arrangements or schemes of arrangement in order to modify the distribution process for, to fit the relevant, the relevant issues. I only say that because the problem with the, our, our, our fairly simple rules on the distribution process is occasionally you can run into difficulties when you get very strange and unusual facts. So our system and our courts have become adept at approving you know, bespoke arrangements to facilitate distributions in those situations. Very briefly, I was just going to touch on a couple of things. Number one is I haven't really dwelt on uh, creditors voluntary liquidation that much. The, 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 the creditors voluntary liquidation, once you're in the process, 
it's actually very similar in how it operates to a compulsory liquidation. That's number one. When you're in that process of either a CVL or a compulsory liquidation, there's not frankly much difference. How do you get in there? The only real difference is rather than starting it all with an application to court, the company will essentially, by passing a resolution of its members, um, state that um, the, the company is insolvent and resolved to commence the, the CVL process. And at that point, creditors have to, within 14 business days, be asked to confirm the identity of the insolvency practitioner taking the job. So largely, once you're in that process, they are, in fact, really very similar, which is why we focused we focus principally on compulsory. I think it would be good if we can sort of deal with those if I sort of interview on interview you on those questions first. Um, the first one, which I think is, is very um, apposite to the particular context of India, is whether or not we have a provision to sell the corporate debtor as a going concern during the liquidation. So in other words, when the liquidator is performing his role of dis realizing assets prior to distributing the proceeds amongst the creditor community. Um, how how often and how frequent and exactly how would he look at disposing of a going concern out of the liquidation? So, so the way it works, Clive, is that a liquidator appointed to a company has no power to require the shareholders of that company to dispose of the shares to a third party. So there is no mechanism for a liquidator to, to procure the sale of the company over which he's appointed. The liquidator can, of course, sell shares and subsidiaries. So he could sell the subsidiary entities as going concerns. We now have more flexibility prior to a liquidation process by virtue of the introduction of the restructuring plan in um, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020, we now have a little bit more flexibility to, to force existing shareholders to, to essentially be diluted down or, or to be taken out of the structure um, without, um, whilst preserving the, the corporate debtor as a, as a going concern. The other point I'll just go back to is if you, if you think about where you started at, at the top of this session, you made the, the very real point that we focus more on the business. So I would say whilst you have a, you know, it's more complicated to sell the corporate debtor as, as a whole, actually it's very straightforward, depending on the nature of the business, to sell the entire business of the corporate debtor, even if you leave you know, the empty shell of the legal entity behind. Hmm. So the liquidator, in other words, would have the flexibility to separate out the good assets from the bad. And if the good assets include a going concern, however you might wish to describe that, but effectively a viable business with vi with continuing uh, employment contracts and so on, uh, he would be able to distribute that, uh, sell that business and ensure that it continued to survive. So I think that that's an important point. I think another question we've been asked is um, uh, yeah, whether, whether a secured creditor, I think you've probably answered this, but whether a secured creditor has the ability to basically take his asset and sell it independently of the liquidation. So typically, if you have the benefit of fixed charge security as opposed to floating charge security, then you will, in theory, be able to say this. I have a essentially have a proprietary right in this asset. I am going to take it back. It falls outside of the um, estate. There are complexities with that. There's an automatic stay. Often the way it works, frankly, is the office holder you know, will approach the secured creditor and say, we know you're the secured creditor here. We're the, we're the liquidator. Here's how we're planning to realise the asset rather than you. Depends what the asset is. But if, if the secured creditor needs essentially an insolvency practitioner to help them sell it, then often they will end up working hand in glove. An example from a, a, a recent approach a recent matter would be let's say you've got a, an airline that's failed and a secured creditor has security over various engines um, even if that's fixed security often the way it works is you'll have an initial exchange of letters where the secured creditor says I have a, a proprietary interest effectively in these these are my engines I want them back and then you very quickly get into the office holder saying we are the best people to get these back for you 
Um, so we will work with you to do that. And that's the neatest thing to do here. Finally, OK. And then the final final question, I think, um, if the, if uh, whether it's uh, an enforcement agency or, or anyone else come to that, if if there is an attachment of assets of any shape or form um, by a third party, whether that's a, a, a regulatory authority or, or a third party creditor or whoever, a judgment creditor or whatever, um, how, how is that dealt with by a liquidator in the UK? It, it rather depends when that order has been obtained. If it's been obtained prior to the insolvency process, it is what it is. It's akin to creating a proprietary interest in the asset. But the whole principle of an English insolvency process generally is getting at the pari passu distribution of assets. So once the process has started, a third party is highly unlikely to be able to obtain an attachment order at that point. So if you already have one, the thing's been done, you have your asset, you have your interest and you can then go about recovering that in the usual way and how you do that will depend on what the asset is. But if you have not, the English court is unlikely to award you that type of relief because mm. essentially what that is doing is you know, um, bumping bumping you up the bumping you up the, the the capital structure where you'd otherwise sit, especially if you're an unsecured creditor originally. Yeah. Good. Well, that's um, that's really what we were going to say about liquidation. We've got a few slides which we included, which are largely uh, informative, which are um, illustrative of the fact that we in the UK, we haven't got it right yet. We're still reforming our law. Um, so uh, we, we, as I said, we introduced our law in 1986. We, there was a big and significant reform, particularly in relation to the administration process in 2002. Most of what's developed since then has been by evolution of custom and practice. Um, but we did reform our law this very year under the guise of a COVID um, reform, but actually it was more significant than that. Uh, we've got some slides and we'll just very, very, very quickly um, run through those slides before we, we hand on to the next uh, presentation. John, do you want to do that very quickly? Very happy to. And look, I'll, I'll keep these brief because there is a lot of comment out there um, publicly available on these measures and what they do. In really simple terms, what the government did over the, the spring and implemented in June was it said we need to do two things. We need to introduce some emergency measures to deal with COVID. And we then want to implement some additional measures which we've been thinking about for, for four or five years. Um, and we think now is the right time with all the uncertainty in the market to make fundamental reforms to our insolvency laws. Why did they do that? Well, there was a essentially there has been a desire to introduce the, the restructuring plan because essentially there's a European directive which is trying to in, introduce similar things. And it became, I think, one of the World Bank's measures for um, one of the World Bank's measures for um, insolvency regimes to include that type of cross-class cram down. So we have, for better or worse, in, in the midst of quite a challenging economic period, we've had some fundamental changes to English insolvency law. The detail is deliberately in the slides. I'm not going to talk through everything. I will just give you a flavour of each of the key features. So number one, um, there is a new standalone moratorium. Previously under English law, the only way you could um, avail yourself of a moratorium, i.e. relief from your creditors if you were distressed, is um, essentially either to complete a restructuring or to enter administration. Or I guess in theory liquidation, but there that's terminal, so it's not really the right comparator, even though there is a stay. So what do we have now? Well, we have a, an ability for a company um, that is in difficulties to essentially apply for a standalone moratorium where the directors remain in control of the business, a bit like Chapter 11 in the US debtor in possession type approach, where they have a monitor, an insolvency practitioner, um, who is essentially monitoring what the directors are doing and is checking that the threshold conditions are met for the moratorium process. Um, it's unlikely to be as 
as popular, I think, as the government may have intended. It's essentially designed to help small businesses bridge through really challenging but largely temporary times. Um, moving on, the restructuring plan is, I think, the most interesting and already the most popular of the measures. This essentially is like an English scheme of arrangement, but it enables you to essentially do, I think, a couple of things. Number one, it enables you to implement a debt for equity restructuring without having to have an insolvency appointment at any point in the group. So previously you needed you could do that by way of a scheme of arrangement and then a prepackaged administration. Now you can do that just through the plan. Why? Because the plan enables you to cram down, I impose the plan without the consent of one or more classes of creditors. So if you're a junior creditor uh, and you're out of the money or you're offered more than you would be, you would realise in administration or liquidation, then if the plan is approved, it can be imposed upon you without your consent. That's a really novel, um, for English law at least, process, and it is already proving popular. Um, Virgin Atlantic and Pizza Express have already proposed restructuring plans. Um, we are looking at another one at the moment, um, and it is highly likely, I think, that over time the plan is going to replace the scheme as the tool of choice for financial restructurings in the UK market. There's also a slide on, um, moving on a couple of slides, there's a slide relating to the restrictions on winding up petitions. I've largely covered these. It's a really interesting change and it's had a pretty fundamental effect on the supply chain because it's essentially withdrawn a key tool of, of, of creditors to force a debtor's hand to pay them. So what removing this right to wind up a company has done is it has actually impacted suppliers throughout the supply chain because it's almost instilled a kind of, you know, won't pay type culture. Um, so when those changes are, are unwound or fall away, uh, I think there's going to be quite a bit of disruption in the market. And then very briefly at the end, we have, as a matter of English contract law, um, it is entirely, it has always been entirely fine to say that in an insolvency, um, the contract can terminate. There's nothing that prohibits the termination of contracts on an insolvency process. Until now, the government has now introduced um, a restriction on the termination of contracts on an insolvency. Um, the aim for that is, the, the real commercial purpose for that is to try and ensure that the business remains intact as much as possible so that more value can be realised for creditors. The initial feedback, and actually we had some feedback from Australia which introduced this some time ago, is that it's having little impact in practice. Why? Because even if um, a supplier is told by an administrator, you must supply to me, you can't terminate the contract, actually in practice most suppliers are saying, well I'm not, not terribly interested in that, um, you're not going to go to court and get a court order because it's going to be too expensive, so we should just have a commercial discussion about what the terms of you know, continued supply look like. So the feedback we have had from the market has been this is probably having the least of all changes, even at least of all effects, even though it is a fundamental rewrite of certain parts of English contract law which have been, you know, which have been operating you know, broadly sensibly for the best part of 300 or 400 years. So that was all I wanted to say on uh, SEGA and with that thank you very much for your time and um, I'll happily hand over to the next speaker. Okay so I think it's Suhash uh, Baram. Are you next? Yes that's right. That's right. Uh, so very good afternoon to, to everybody. Uh, many thanks to uh, the UK government, the bankruptcy board, as well as EY for organizing this session. Uh, it's a real honor to be part of this. And special thanks to uh, Clive um, and, and Herbert Smith, who have been very close friends uh, of the bankruptcy board, as well as the bankruptcy process in India, and, and their um, goodwill and their, um, their eagerness to assist with the process and improving the process is, is deeply appreciated. So my, my sincere gratitude to Herbert Smith. Um, so I think with those words, I'll, I'll go into the overview of the liquidation process in India. Uh, the idea is to give a very brief overview and uh, try and compare and, and um, discuss how it is similar or different to the UK process and what can our learnings be. 
the objective of course so far has been to take learnings from the uk process so we'll try and keep our part of the presentation short um and you know wherever relevant would request uh, 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 clive and his team to uh, step in um so the first slide is is the grounds for liquidation so just to be clear liquidation in india can happen under three routes um i think there's a there's a, there's an element of confusion about this so just to be clear uh the the concept of winding up under the companies act which is very similar to a winding up i imagine under the uk companies act is still available to indian companies uh, all that requires is a special resolution of the shareholders and once that is obtained a company can be taken into wind, into winding up if it's a winding up under the indian companies act then you obviously skip the insolvency resolution process which can last up to 6 months or 9 months so this is a direct route into uh, winding up the big difference of course being that this is not conducted under the bankruptcy code it's under the uh, companies act and therefore it follows its own process its own logic and its own waterfall the second route is uh, under the bankruptcy code uh, under the bankruptcy code there are two routes into liquidation one is a voluntary liquidation um slightly different from how it is interpreted in the uk in india voluntary liquidation in the context of the bankruptcy court means where it is a solvent liquidation and the company does not have any debts or has not defaulted on any of its debts um and the second route of liquidation under the bankruptcy court is actually what we are discussing and what we have on a slide is an insolvent liquidation which means that your insolvency resolution process has failed within 6 to 9 months and there being no other recourse the company is now uh, being forcefully put into liquidation uh just one word of um, you know i i, I a comment more than anything as to what i think the ibbi representatives were mentioning earlier as to how liquidation is the last resort and very often uh, you know not a very enviable resort and should should not be resorted to very easily the only comment you know with great respect i'd like to make there is that there are companies which unfortunately are rife for liquidation uh, even though there is a, a policy uh, bias towards resolution which is admirable because that leads to better realization as well as saving jobs um, i think at the same time a bias against liquidation can also have uh, its own set of problems where we are trying to keep companies alive Uh, even though they don't have a useful economic purpose and could further burden uh, the banking sector or for that matter promoters or even creditors and employees of the company uh, because a company which does not have any cash flows or assets uh, will not be able to service its debt or pay its employees um with those initial comments are going to the grounds for liquidation under the indian bankruptcy code the grounds for insolvent liquidation that is so one is if the committee of creditors itself resolves liquidate the company at any stage during the crp process second is whether coc is not able to submit a resolution plan to the nclt third is where a resolution plan has been submitted but its terms have been violated by the successful bidder and fourth is where a resolution plan is taken to the nclt but the nclt believes that that plan is non compliant with law and therefore must be rejected um we we note that in practice if you see all these four grounds then the first one is rarely used uh we have not seen the committee of creditors resolve to liquidate a company without first giving it a good push towards resolution so we will find that i mean in my knowledge as far as i am aware there are probably no cases where in the first or second meeting of the committee of creditors a company has been resolved to be liquidated um this i i feel um happens it does not have a, a very good result particularly in companies which are in the engineering or a procurement or construction business epc business um because the moment an epc business goes into a crp process the value depletion is very rapid and very often the liquidation will yield a better result but however there is uh, the committee of creditors wants to give it a good push resolution a good push and uh, only then try to liquidate as 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 the last resort um the third point also is important where the resolution plan has been violated so we have seen in the first couple of years of ipc some very notable and high profile cases where uh, resolution plans have been violated by the bidders uh, but we have not seen a liquidation order i think there again we see um, 
uh, a reluctance on the part of NCLD or even the higher superior courts to liquidate a company even though a plan has been violated. Uh, there is a tendency to grant a second chance or a third chance to bidders or to the COC to try and revive even though an approved plan has failed. So I think I think we can move on to the next line. Thank you. So the concept of consequences of liquidation are quite straightforward. Uh, first of all, there is a moratorium on legal proceedings. Uh, this is important to note because this is, seems to be on paper at least little different from the moratorium which is imposed during the CIP process. Because this moratorium, the, the section 35 of, of the IBC says that this is a moratorium on institution of any fresh legal proceedings. Uh, there is some element of doubt whether legal proceedings which were initiated prior to insolvency commencement date, whether those can automatically revive or whether this moratorium is on all legal proceedings whatsoever. Given the objective of the code, uh, I think a beneficial view should be taken that it is a moratorium on all legal proceedings, whether pre-existing or fresh. I think that's the only way a liquidation process can be carried out in an orderly manner. Second is discharge of the officers and employees of the company. This again is similar to the concept of the professional or the administrator uh, taking control over the management and board of the company. And the last again is, is obvious that the board ceases to exist and all the powers are now vested with the liquidator. Uh, the appointment of the liquidator again uh, is, is more often than not is the same insolvency professional who was running the process, the ICIRP process, is, uh, gen is generally appointed as a liquidator. There are a few exceptions. One is where the, liquid, the insolvency professional had proposed a plan which turns out to be non-compliant with law and the NCLT is forced to liquidate the company. Second is where the bankruptcy board recommends replacement of the RP. And third, of course, is when the RP uh, herself fails to submit the written consent and is not interested in, in continuing any further. Uh, as far as the stages of the liquidation process is concerned, uh, we can divide the liquidation process into two broad buckets. One is when you are trying to resolve the company or you're trying to resolve the business of the company as a going concern. That is one broad bucket. And the second bucket is when you're trying to realize the assets either on a standalone basis or a slump sale basis or in parcels. So these are the two broad routes that one can follow in liquidation. Uh, recent amendments in the bankrupt by the bankruptcy board in the CIP regulations uh, basically now provide that the committee of creditors while voting on a resolution plan or choosing to go down in liquidation must specify whether they prefer a sale as a going concern or they are happy for the liquidator to take his or her own call during the liquidation process. Um, in our experience, in the limited experience that we have had since these amendments came through, committee of creditors think twice before voting to resolve the company as a going concern because of the associated uh, complexities that arise, chief of which is the whole issue of trying to resolve via a scheme of arrangement. Um, because I think as, as um, uh, Clive and his colleague were mentioning earlier, um, in a scheme of arrangement, at least under the UK law, from, from what I understand, if you are underwater or if the value breaks and you are below that value, then you don't get the ability to vote on a scheme or to really be able to consent to participate in the resolution process. Whereas if you see how the scheme of arrangement is worded under the Indian context, each class of creditor gets a distinct vote. And not only each class of creditor, but even the members, that is shareholders of the company get a vote. Now, of course, shareholders who, whose equity value has completely been eroded and now the company is in liquidation, for them to get a vote in a scheme of arrangement, uh, in principle, it just seems inconsistent. So it would be helpful if there's some judicial guidance on this part uh, that by virtue of their equity value having been eroded, uh, that automatically should mean that they should not have a voice in a scheme of arrangement in the liquidation process, particularly where such promoters are banned under Section 29A of the IBC. So there's a 90 day process uh, which the liquidator can use for the scheme to be run through and implemented. And this 90 days over and above the 365 days which the bankruptcy board 
has recommended and the, and the IBC has recommended for completion of a liquidation process. Uh, as far as the sale is concerned, there is a fair degree of flexibility given to the liquidator. The sale of the assets on a standalone basis can either be by way of a public auction or it can be by way of private treaties as long as it's through a transparent process which leads to proper price discovery and there is no um, and the stakeholders committee which is constituted in liquidation is kept abreast of all material developments as long as it's a transparent and fair process there's a fair degree of flexibility offered to the liquidator This is the uh, distribution waterfall in, in liquidation. I think most of us are quite familiar with it. Uh, the reason it's been set out here is to um, underscore the point that this liquidation waterfall is different from the one which is contained under the uh, Companies Act. And um, for very often we find companies who directly want to go into liquidation uh, would choose the option under Companies Act without having to come through the IBC process because if liquidation is the end game and that is known to the promoters of the company, then they'd rather go through the easier and shorter route under the Companies Act. Um, having said that, maybe we can just quickly go through the, the, the distribution waterfall. Um, first is the insolvency resolution cost and the liquidation cost. Uh, yeah, thank you, Sanjay. Uh, second is uh, the dues of secured creditors and workmen's dues up to 24 months, and they appear on a pari passu basis at the second level. Third is dues of employees for the past 12 months. Now, practically speaking, we can go down the list, but practically speaking, if a company is going into liquidation, then we can be rest assured that there won't be any water in the waterfall beyond level two, uh, because liquidation pretty much implies that secure creditors are also not getting their dues. Therefore, there won't be anything beyond level two during a liquidation process. Um, we have financial unsecured financial creditors at number four, government dues, which uh, includes now thanks to the clarification issued by and the amendment made to section 31.1 of the IBC. Now it's amply clear that this includes tax authorities and other government and revenue authorities. Uh, which is again a big change from how the Companies Act uh, waterfall used to read uh, earlier, where crown debt or the concept of government use was actually given uh, priority, but now it's been subordinated. Um, and goes without saying, you've got preference shareholders and equity right at the end. And this therefore begs the question whether equity and preference shareholders should even get a voice in a scheme of arrangement if you were to go down that route. We can move on, Sanjay. Thank you. Uh, this again, I think the Indian participants would be very well aware of Section 29A of the IBC, uh, which says, which lays out who all can be eligible uh, resolution applicants who can submit a bid during a CIP process, and it also lays out who can purchase assets in liquidation. Um, and when I say assets in liquidation, it, this does not necessarily mean as a going concern, but even if secure creditors were choosing to stay outside of the IBC process and choosing to realize their security by themselves, are trying to sell or realize their security, they also must make sure that um, it's not being sold or alienated to individuals or corporates who are barred under Section 29A. So this onus is not only on the liquidator, but also on secure creditors. I think the list of disqualifications under 29A, again, we all aware of um, the individual, the person being a willful defaulter, where the account has been classified as an NPA for more than one year, if the person is convicted of certain economic offenses and certain other regulatory disqualifications. I'll quickly touch upon the second disqualification here, where the account has been classified as a non-performing asset for more than one year. Now, this disqualification comes in even if you're a resolution applicant or a bidder in the CIP process. So you could well have a company where the company has gone into IBC. The company is also turned into an NP, but because it's not been for more than one year, the promoters and shareholders of that company can propose a resolution plan. But once you are in liquidation territory, then that NPA would more often than not have been lasted for more than one year because you go through a nine month IBC process, uh, then you CRP process, then you come to liquidation. So the way uh, the liquidation regulations and 29A um, interact 
is that promoters are basically out of the process and they will not be able to um, acquire assets of the company because of the NPA disqualification. I'm not going into the other disqualification, but on the NPA disqualification. I think this, these were you know, some of the very broad topical issues we wanted to cover. I think there are certain other questions which probably will come up now in case we go into the case study, which talks about attachment by enforcement agencies and other regulatory authorities. And then maybe you know we can we can have further views from from um, Hubbard Smith as well. I think we can remove the slides now, Sanjana. Thanks. So just wanted uh, you know uh, Bahram and Clive uh, our distribution and you know, let, let, let me start with thanking you uh, you know Hubbard Smith, uh, IBBI, and the UK government for organizing the session and for the panel. Welcome the panelists. Um, just wanted, uh, Baharam and Clive, your views on some of the issues now that we have got a broad framework in place. Just wanted to, uh, you know, pick your thoughts on some of the issues, particularly still as a going concern. Uh, not a new concept in India, just to provide context to the participants. Not really a new concept, predated IBC in India with, uh, you know, at least I know of Allahabad Bank uh, versus ARC Holdings, the Supreme Court judgment which talked about liquidation as a going concern. But uh, even since, you know, since then, um, NCLAT seemed to have incorporated that in an IBC context as well. However, the concept of going concern while very well recognized in tax and in liquidation under the Companies Act, the earlier regime, it still seems to create a lot of confusion. I mean, we have in CIRP process, we have auditors having a very different understanding who say, well, I'm going to give you audit qualification. This will not continue as a going concern. Uh, the moment it goes into CIRP, but we are talking of sale as a going concern today. So just wanted to understand from you the ambit of, uh, you know, what exactly is going concern from an insolvency perspective and, you know, what are the different aspects? Clive, if you can start with UK law, that will be easier. Sorry, I, I think you're on mute, Clive. Apologies. Yes. Um, yeah, we did. We did quite a bit of research on that very question um, because we were asked in the Indian uh, context whether there was any helpful guidance from English law about what going concern actually means. And somewhat unhelpfully, it doesn't really have a legal meaning at all. And such guidance as there is suggests that you look at things on a on a case by case basis. Um, so trying to sort of read across in, into um, the context here that we're talking about, really it's, it's, it's going to be a common sense analysis every time. What is the going concern and, and, and how you define it? You, you simply just have to be um, pragmatic, I think, and very commercial in your um, assessment of what going concern is and therefore how you implement disposals out of whether it's a CIRP or uh, a liquidation process. Uh, I, I tend to look at it. I tend to look at it, Clive, in our, in our insolvency context. Is where does it come up? And I appreciate there may be tax meanings, there may be other meanings, but the one for us is that what is one of the purposes of administration? It's the rescue of a company as a going concern. I think what that means to my mind is a viable legal entity that is able to pay its debts, its return to solvency. So in simple terms, you're not going to have a creditor trying to wind you up on day one and you know, the directors can be comfortable, they can continue to trade without filing. But as Clive, you're absolutely right. It's there's not a prescriptive legal definition for it. It's one of those things that you, you, you know if you're not in it because of the consequence, either you're, you're defending winding up petitions left, right and centre, or your directors are, 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 are on the other side are, are uncomfortable continuing to trade. Hmm. Sorry. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I, I think it's a pretty vexed question. I, if I can just start, uh, by again uh, thanking IBBI, the UK government, Herbert Smith and ENY. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't thank my own colleagues as well uh, 
for for this opportunity and of course to all of you who have been so patient and uh, been with us uh, over the uh, last hour and longer i'm also quite delighted that uh, someone in the audience is near an airport and it seems pretty busy airport because i hear the aircrafts quite regularly but uh, uh, I don't know whether it's uh, in the UK. I hope it's in India. That would be a good sign if some of our airports are busy. But if you could please put it on mute, uh, it, it would be beneficial for everybody. So, uh, Clive, you may uh, remember. In fact, we I, I believe we had a discussion on these lines uh, maybe two years ago. I think it was at a, a conference in Delhi, if I recollect right. And you know the key question there was, how do we make uh, the Indian market more attractive for uh, distress assets? And uh, this had come up, and in some ways, it's kind of an oxymoron because uh, you know, uh, as John just said, if it's if you're talking about the entity, uh, then in liquidation, how can that survive the? entity has to die i mean liquidation is a funeral and uh, it's uh, it's the assets or a slump sale or the business as you all have all said i think we should really focus on the business rather than the entity but uh, in india it is what it is and there's already been some changes maybe we'll need some uh, uh, statutory clarifications down the road but at present, I completely agree with uh, what uh, you've said that we need to uh, take a commercial approach. We saw the statistics, the statistics for recovery. There have been just three cases as far as I know. And in those three, the recovery was 188% of uh, liquidation value. So clearly uh, there are situations where the going concern or slump sale or asset sale, whatever you want to call it, uh, gives you a much better recovery. And it would be bizarre not to do that. So we should do that. We should make it easier to do that. The uh, troubling statistic is that there have just been three and they have been exceedingly slow. So even though it's supposed to be done in 90 days, it uh, takes much, much longer. So I think the the key issues that all of us in India have to consider is how to make this more efficient. And uh, there are you know certain other points which I'm sure Pius will bring up uh, issues which we would like uh, your experience. I think uh, as both Mr. Kumar and Mr. Kavade said to learn from your experience as we have been doing right from uh, i don't know 2015 uh, would be very beneficial hmm. but I, I think one of the one of the i know it's not it's specifically on the agenda but it it is it is a subject of topical discussion in, in india um one of the things which um, we believe would be helpful is introducing in some shape or form the concept of prepacks because a lot of what we do is more or less lined up in advance. So we are using formal processes, be it administration, be it liquidation, does not matter. We are using the formal process as a means to an end, but very much having done most of the preparatory work in anticipation, and therefore we're not eating up time between the institution of the formal process and the execution of the relevant transaction. And I, and I think that the, the way, and we've evolved to that, we didn't start that way, we've evolved. Um, and, I, and I think that, that if there was a, a greater ability to, to contemplate and achieve uh, a pre-packed solution in the Indian context, um, it would help you because it would mean that it was actually possible to do things much quicker and it was possible to um, preserve value because the two things go hand in hand. Time erodes value. So, so I, I think that would be one of the good um, things to come out of these sorts of concerns going forward. 
Thanks. Um, so I think, uh, Pim, should I, should I respond to that? Please. Yes, please. So, so I think the good news there, Clive, is that uh, uh, we are actively working on that. In hmm. fact, uh, sorry, I put my camera off just to make sure that the sound is good. So uh, IBBI may throw a further light on this, but we are working actively on that. We thought as well, as you may remember, again, going all the way back to 2016, hmm. that we would come to prepacks again take a phased approach as the UK mm. had done and mm. now we believe is the right time uh, for uh, bringing in uh, the prepack regime uh, very much based on the UK regime and uh, I think it may be that uh, we you know phase it even more by starting out uh, with uh, uh, SMEs because mm. uh, uh, they are in real difficulty and then seeing how it goes get some learnings and quickly in a couple of months thereafter rolling it out for everybody. Uh, that, uh, that's the view of the uh, government today. Hmm. So, uh, Bahram, just, just taking on from the cue from your earlier observation, uh, now that we have uh, a recent Delhi NCLT order in Mohan Jams, um, querying whether regulations uh, you know uh, related to sale as a going concern uh, do they uh, you know do they actually work contrary to ibc uh, though ult ultimately the regulations followed an NCLAT judgment uh, from gujarat and Arico and followed from there um, and also because we again have uh, a kolkata judgment which says well there is nothing equivalent to section 30 uh, of uh, cirp in the context of liquidation therefore we are not in, inclined to grant reliefs that you will see in a CIRP process as an exemption from liabilities. Um, do you think it's, 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 it's appropriate to think of a statutory mechanism uh, and have a statutory recognition of sale as a going concern? Or do you think currently drafted regulations will work the way they are? I just wanted to pick your thoughts on that. No, so I think that's a, those are very crucial issues. Uh, that going concern is not going to work if uh, we don't resolve the liability issue and that if it is not very much a mirror image of what happens in the CIRP process. Uh, so uh, we have to do whatever it takes, whether it comes through the courts or uh, whether it comes uh, through a, a, an amendment. Uh, we have to do that because otherwise it's uh, a uh, pretty non-workable to my mind. Hi, I'm just, I am just wanted to ask you in terms of liquidation, there is no timeline prescribed under the UK laws. Of course, I mean, as as, as Bahram and Pulkit pointed out earlier, uh, we have prescribed timelines, uh, hmm. particularly under CIRP as well as liquidation. And while, you know, one way to look at it is, of course, uh, that we are not in 100% compliance of those timelines. But at the same time, I think we are doing fairly good uh, mm. from pre IBC days to today. Uh, but I think still, uh, you know, um, some sense of urgency is still required to resolve some set of cases. Um, how do you think that is achieved, uh, you know, in UK context without a prescribed timeline? Uh, what has your experience been? Is liquidation process smoother, faster than we see in India? I mean, you just saw the timelines. Uh, yes. and was prescribed one year, but you know earlier it was two years. So, mm -hmm. what is your sense of timelines here? Well, we've 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 never really had them in the way that you have introduced them, or at least I can't remember them. Uh, so, uh, and but we have, but I think you've you've used timelines because of a particular need to introduce time bound resolutions, uh, and so I think the contexts are very different in that sense. Um, the timelines for us are really driven by value preservation. So in other words, value preservation is implies speed wherever speed is possible. Um, so that's been the driver. And I think the creditor led um, processes that we've developed over the years ha have meant that the creditors incentivize speedy resolution. We do have timelines for filing reports and for for gathering information and you know for, for the liquidator and the insolvency practitioners um, to uh, 
to introduce to, to, to distribute information that sort of timeline but we don't have those hurdles that you have um, that were on that um, one of your slides there and I don't but I think that's just because we haven't needed them and, and I think you've got to use timelines where they're needed so I, I don't uh, I don't really have a view whether it's right or wrong I think I think you're using them sensibly where you can and I think from the international perspective if I can comment on that you know it was remarkable to see those timelines introduced um, in the in the IBC originally and we were very positively impressed by the fact that they were by and large stuck to and that that was a sea change really in the positive perception of India from abroad so I think you've used them sensibly and, and effectively and it's been a very positive thing That's great to hear, uh, you know, and, and I think thankfully uh, my sense is hopefully in terms of timelines, we still seem to be uh, improving a lot. And I think as time goes by in liquidation and more and more focus comes in, hopefully the timelines will improve because right now that's the next level. In CIR, mm -hmm. enough experience has been built, but in liquidation, it's still at an ascent stage in comparison. Um, mm -hmm. just, just, just wanted to also understand from you, um, how do you value maximize? Um, I mean, if in terms of issues in India, the way we see it is, you know, one of course is time. It's a function of time, yes. Um, secondly, we also see that, you know, predators take time in release of assets, partially at the two regulations, but that's part of the, you know, issue. So just wanted to have Bahram and your thought, uh, you know, in terms of what can we do better to deepen the, the distress asset market uh, in India? Uh, are you talking about the sort of auction type? Yes, yes, process. yes, yes. So the auction processes are prescribed under I, under, under for, for liquidation, but mm. uh, can we do something uh, better in, 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 in that? I think I think value is always a very difficult issue in the in any insolvency process because establishing value and and demonstrating that proper value has been achieved, which is which is obviously a key driver for the insolvency practitioner. Um, it is vital. Now, John mentioned that in the context of realising assets out of a liquidation, um, we've developed close coordination between the practitioner who is running the process and the key creditors with an interest in the maximisation of value. And that's obviously partly so that the practitioner is protected against liability of um, you know, claiming that he hasn't done his best uh, for the benefit of the credit community. But formalising that is very difficult. I think information about what assets are available, certainly from the international perspective, you know, finding out what is actually available and, and giving an equivalence of information to the broader community is, is critical. And I think there's always been um, you know, in any in any process, you struggle to ensure that sufficient information is available to demonstrate what opportunities there are and what value might be. So I think somehow or other, and I'm not, I haven't got any brilliant ideas about how you might achieve this, but I think the overall objective has to be to to be transparent about what assets are available, what assets are. Um, you know, uh, uh, and as much information about the underlying businesses as possible. So beyond information and transparency, I don't have anything sort of particularly perceptive to say, I don't think. Do you, what do you think, Baron? No, so I agree with you. I think information, uh, transparency, that's the key. So maybe some kind of uh, bidding platform, some efficient uh, uh, digital platform which allows you to do this also in terms of the uh, information efficiency as uh, Clive said I think that may help but there are uh, some you know uh, I don't know whether it's international Clive you tell me or uh, is it you know quite particular to India or Asia uh, I mean certainly the last question I have to you is uh, that uh, one of the obstacles and the delays 
uh, that often happen are because the promoter holds some of the key assets and therefore if especially if you're in that going concern or uh, asset business transfer mold then not having those key assets to operate the business uh, becomes a huge hindrance so is there an efficient way to uh, bring that into the fold and to streamline that process so so sorry the process you mean in what sense the you know so say uh, if uh, the promoter uh, owns the port asset and you've taken yeah. a steel plant uh, yes. you need port to be functioning or the mm. coal mine to be functioning or the pipeline so yeah. he has to you have to find a way to bring him on board while mm. he may try and do everything to thwart the process so unfortunately in india we come across that quite often yes i mean i can think of a particular example where there were some intertwined assets if i can use that expression and um to a degree i think in that case it came down to a commercial negotiation uh with the i mean we we came to that situation basically where there was a um a distressed business which was highly dependent upon a, a non-distressed business uh, within the same promoter group and some of the advice we gave to particular creditors was along the lines of can you find a way of putting both sides of the business you know, both sides of these sort of enterprise into the same process and running the same process um, in parallel now um i can't remember the exact details off the top of my head of how how we how we tackled the each and every sort of point of that but it, it has struck me that that some of the discussion that's been going on at a sort of theoretical level about group insolvency for example is all about how you try to disentangle those sorts of situations and there's no one size fits all solution that i can see at the moment and i think the the reluctance to introduce group insolvency you know in countless jurisdictions is all about the the fact that you can't you can't sort of design a one size fits all solution and i think a lot of insolvency resolutions are all about um you know a complicated intercreditor intersupplier um negotiation really isn't it um half of it half of it is finding out the information half of it is effectively negotiating a compromise and i think the it is a uniquely indian thing the, the sort of promoter group concept and the way the intertwined businesses have been kept um sort of separate i think for deliberate um reasons by a number of the promoters um yeah Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think uh, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. I think uh, we have quite a few questions waiting. Uh, oh, uh, rather move to, uh, you know, I, I, I would rather move to the case study and, 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 and then the questions uh, so that you know, we are able to answer that. Sanjana, you want to move to case study? Mm. So essentially a case where the CIRP has been initiated and the company has gone into liquidation. The IRP has become the RP, uh, so RP has become in effect uh, um, the liquidator. Now, I, th I think we'll have to move to it. The next slide probably easy, easier to go there. Now, 
as as earlier discussed uh, one 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 way is to explore the scheme of arrangement under section 230 now obviously the question is uh, the liquidator continues to run the business as a going concern basis because you know that's typically what uh, the nclt would mandate until unless there is no value left in it and uh, then the coc recommends that liquidator should explore section 230 um in terms of issues uh that are faced at least as far as indian law is concerned i think the the, the issue is more around uh that the idea on what 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 role exactly liquidator has is more defined very broadly uh, in in a broad sense by the regulations and by the court order it doesn't exactly follow the pattern under the companies act as such but you know just wanted to say you know uh Any, any any thoughts on that, Polkit or Suhash? As I see it, the liquidator would be purely guided by what the court says in this context, um, and of course, in a scheme of compromise and arrangement, the liquidator have to. I mean, until unless he is very clear that uh, you know the process has failed, for which he will have to, of course, run the complete process. Um, only then will he go into liquidation by way of a set sale that, that that's the import of the recent supreme court judgment as well on this i i'll, I'll try and answer that uh, piyush so so i think the role of the liquidator as far as uh, scheme of arrangement is concerned is um, um is it's quite well laid out as far as the process ibc process is concerned on paper as to how he needs to convene the meetings how he needs to get the relevant consents and the timeline that's laid out for 90 days uh the process on paper is quite well laid out i think the practical issue we are facing is that in practice ensuring a scheme gets adequate votes and goes through all the hurdles within 90 days is very difficult um because convening meeting of first of all classifying creditors into different classes sending them the notice yes. um there could be certain disputes about creation of classes themselves uh we have seen in the past that secured creditors with various levels of security would obviously want to be classified in a different class altogether where they are probably the only member of that class so there's a lot of dispute intercreditor dispute i think as um clive was mentioning so in practice i think we'll see a few challenges um on the second question of whether the liquidation process will continue in parallel while the liquidator explores the possibility of entering into a scheme i don't think there is any restriction as such uh where the li- liquidator can try both things at the same time trying to organize a scheme while at the same time seeing if there is interest of uh, in the assets of the company on a piecemeal basis or an, on a, on a garage sale sort of a basis uh but i think the problem is uh, if both are, are pursued simultaneously then the uh, certainty of both is i think to some level challenged and in practice i think like and there are participants here maybe they can clarify i think the dominant uh, methodology is to first pursue scheme of arrangement and once that fails then give liquidation on a piecemeal basis a real shot i think also relevant to remember is that many a times they don't go into the class uh, you know classification when when doing a scheme of arrangement in that sense and nclt has changed for the companies act also can said let the coc determine it first So it's in effect a mini CRP process, but of course, quite a few of them have run beyond 90 days. That shall we move to the next slide, Sajana? Sorry, can we move to the next slide, please? I think we have discussed the sale of uh, corporate debtor as a going concern. Um, so the liquidator has started the liquidation process in this. Uh, there are quite a few open employees, so obviously that's a concern. That's why uh, that forms the basis also of the recent Supreme Court decision that should be absolute last resort. Um, now, sorry, I think we have to go to the last slide. The previous slide. Previous, previous. Uh, 
I've actually I've presented the same. I think so. There's some network issue. Sure. sure. Um, mm -hmm. So in effect, um, the sale of CD or its business as a going concern, or is it his discretion? Um, the liquidity and needs guidance supervision uh, for sale of its business as a going concern, especially after 2:30 timeline has expired. Uh, to do it step by step is difficult because already you know, uh, one process has run. Typically. We see liquidation as a going concern. Uh, we don't typically end up seeing, you know, both 230, 230 it can be proposed at the same time, but we typically don't see them one after the other. Uh, of course, liquidation as a going concern has been explored uh, by extension of time, just like in a CIRP process, there is extension. Um, the, contrib the contribution by lenders towards liquidation cost, um, well, I would say it will be considered as because it's 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 a, it's, it's part of the liquidation cost itself, right? So it, it's a contribution, and therefore, yes, it will be considered as contribution towards liquidation cost, and therefore, as you know, not really. I, I don't know whether interim finance is is a correct word for it, but definitely it forms part of the liquidation cost that, that that is there because the funding has been specifically for that purpose. Um, I think, and this this remains an issue. Uh, what is the sale of corporate debtor as a going concern and a sale of business of the corporate debtor as a going concern? Um, as Clive and Bayram have already pointed out, um, you know, there are a whole lot of open issues there. Um, difficult to, you know, distinguish between the two in, 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 in complete sense. But typically, if a corporate debtor is viable by itself and has one particular project, for example, and is sold, uh, it's, it's one and the same. It's just one single business. If not, it could have multiple verticals, each one of which could be sold independently with its assets and liabilities. Typically, a company would have certain viable business businesses which are different undertakings and others which may, may not be viable as a going concern. So, for example, it could have a land bank lying somewhere at the same time where it was, uh, you know, proposing to set up a manufacturing plant and at the same time have a manufacturing plant or a power company having five units which are operational, but one unit which is not. The five units which are operational are going concern, but the sixth one is not. I think that's that's how I would differentiate between the two. But, you know, if, if the panelists, uh, you know, have any add-on thoughts to it, happy. Um, just one thing to add to what you just said, Piyush, you know, when you're trying to do sale of the corporate debtor as a going concern, um, one uh, theoretical challenge we face is that under uh, the liquidation chapter of IBC, the company needs to be dissolved at the end of the liquidation process. So I think there's a bit of a contradiction in trying to rescue the corporate debtor as a going concern, um, especially when we need to have a dissolution at the end of the process. Now, if you look at the business of the corporate debtor as a going concern, um, I think Again, as you said, the conceptual distinction between the two is not very clear. Uh, but I would imagine it means that the the business of the corporate debtor would entail all its operation, existing contracts, um, long term contracts for for service delivery with counterparties, with government and so on, which I think in some sense is <clears throat> is similar to a slump sale. Uh, but the reason for some confusion is because slump sale is separately listed as one of the options that the liquidator can pursue. So in, in my view, liquidation of the corp business of the corporate debtor is a going concern is the closest to a slump sale. But we find that slump sale is separately listed as well. So unfortunately, hmm. I am not able to add more answers, but <laughs> raise more questions. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I think this issue of of how on earth you fund a going concern, which is in a liquidation, uh, is a very tricky question. And I, and I think the to, to make sale as a going concern viable, you have to have cash flows or you have to have um, funding available. And I think the lending community um, doesn't really um, sort of empathize with with what the sort of conceptual objective is. So, so I think if there is to be an effective means of um, effectively liquidators running going concerns so as to dispose of them in some shape or form, be it by a slump sale or some other way, 
some thought needs to be given to how you secure any external funding that you need to achieve that. Uh, and I don't know whether that thinking has been done, to be honest. I think that's, that, that's a fair point, Clive. I mean, in India, I think the regulations provide uh, for, for, you know, lenders to fund it at least the liquidation costs. Mm. But of course, where there are no, and this is particularly applicable in, in the context of the current set of cases that are in liquidation because a lot of them are transferred from BIFR. So that's why mm. our data on liquidation is also skewed. We are seeing more liquidation because they are hangover of cases that were going on earlier and non-operational. And yeah. therefore, you know, it becomes very important that, uh, you know, lenders fund part of it and see even if it's an asset sale that it goes through. Mm. Uh, but of course, you know, if it has a negative cash flow, whether it will have, you know, any real value of sale as a going concern until unless it has viable business units, which are a standalone, um, mm. is it difficult to predict. And typically mm. an asset sale would sound like a more logical choice to do rather than a going concern uh, mm. of, of PD for sure. Mm. Uh, Suhash, a very, uh, you know, very important aspect that you highlighted because you're absolutely right. Section 64, uh, you know, does come in the way of sale of CD as a going concern. And that's precisely where the Delhi NCLT has raised an issue uh, in the context of Mohan Jem's case. So we're very topical. Uh, it's 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 something that has happened as recently as a month ago. Sanna, shall we move on to the last slide? That's that's one of the open issues. I mean, we are we are still uh, dealing with uh, you know attachments of assets by investigating authorities in a lot of CIRP cases because obviously. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, issues of diversion of funds, etc. Uh, I think the most uh, one in news is right now BPSL, where enforcement director has, you know, uh, appealed to, you know, and matter is pending in Supreme Court right now. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, Clive, your experience in terms of, you know, uh, what has the UK experience been in terms of attachment of assets by government authorities because of Diversion of funds or fraud being suspected and all of that. Um, how does how, how does UK regime deal with that? Uh, well, shall I ask John to perhaps comment on on that more specifically? I mean, the, the it's it's to I think he touched on it in what he was saying earlier about the um, investigation into antecedent transactions. But John, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, th I think you. Uh, yeah. Uh, John, if you could just say how what the interaction would be between, say, SFO uh, and the liquidation process. Of course. So Cl Clive's summary is, is, is a good one of the position, but essentially the you know, the ability to actually for the for the government somehow to seek attachment orders against the, the, the company in the process. That really isn't how it happens over here. You have essentially the liquidator trying to the way we separate things over here is you have the liquidator who is trying to gather in assets the office holder has the best powers to do that they have all the reviewable transaction powers we mentioned the ability to look at general breaches of directors duties and so the way it tends to work over here is the liquidator is the person who is seeking to gather assets into the company they have the best powers you then have the insolvency service, you have the SFO sometimes, you have various other regulators, including you know, if it's listed, the FCA, um, if there's an accountant on the board, you ha can have the, the FRC. A number of other regulators can also bring proceedings, but typically those proceedings are looking at bringing either disqualification proceedings against directors or seeking very specific criminal type sanctions or professional type sanctions against certain people. So it tends, when you're in those messy situations, you will tend to have the liquidator who'll be running certain claims himself. And then you'll have a parallel, parallel processes where various regulators are looking to impose typically regulatory sanctions, but there may also be criminal sanctions but from a simple perspective it's often the liquidator who has the best powers to go and pursue people for various pieces of wrongdoing um, and frankly aside from reviewable transaction powers the best is just general good old-fashioned breach of breach of director's duties. 
But, but effectively, the, 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 our office holder has to report, doesn't he, uh, on whether he's found transactions that are worth looking into, if I can sort of put it in lay terms. Essentially, yes, there's an obligation on the office holder in every situation to send a report to the Secretary of State and that report forms the basis as to is the Secretary of State going to investigate the directors for the purposes of disqualification proceedings. Mm. Um, there's because, nothing. Because, yeah, because one of one of the things that we've we've looked at again, trying to sort of read across the way we do things into it, into the Indian context is how, who is actually going to run the investigation into um, antecedent transactions and more precisely who's going to pay for it. So the way that we've structured things which, which John has touched on is that essentially we've got state entities which having received the information can actually um, pursue pursue issues. Um, and we, we have in the past once speculated whether um, some sort of a parallel role for MCA or something like that might be appropriate in India, which would mean that you did have some um, state sort of funding, as it were, for for inquiry into suspect transactions, which would ultimately could generate value, but may not. Thank you very much. Clive, that is helpful. Um, just to answer some of the questions, because there are other questions pending. Um, quickly, in terms of assets of the corporate data, which if they're attached by the CD, can they be sold by the liquidator? Um, practically, I find that very difficult to do because obviously the liquidator will not have possession and the buyer will find it you know, difficult to pay a price for it. Um, typically speaking, in Winsome Diamond case and on, onwards, one would have said that an attachment is vacated, uh, you know, the that I mean, of course, the liquidator will have to move NCLT to get it vacated formally. But uh, typically, uh, because the matter is still right now pending in BPSL case in front of Supreme Court, we'll have to await that to see, you know, what the ultimate outcome is. But I would imagine for a liquidator to sell that asset would be difficult without a court order as of now. Um, Attachment of property, again, as I said, you know, uh, subject to BPSL case, but our earlier understanding was yes, attachment of property uh, is, 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 is not valid during this during the liquidation process also, because obviously it gives rise uh, to, you know, uh, problems in terms of liquidating a set. Um, definitely during CIRP, it's a question which is pending in BPSL, and that's the question that will come up again. The code has been fairly clear in that sense that there can be no attachment during the CIRP process. Um, in terms of the last question, if the delay caused on account of attachment of assets be excluded from the process timeline, which has impacted the fee payable to the, to, to the liquidator, subject to discretion of NCLT, yes, but not automatically. Obviously, the liquidator will, will argue that as a justification, but um, uh, you know, an NCLT order is required to that effect for any exclusion of timelines. In, in, in any case, liquidation has a broader timeline, but at the end of it, when, when they go back to NCLT to see that, these justifications are very clearly sought for. I think there are some questions uh, in the group. Um, I will just try to answer, take some of them just So just on, on taking a couple of questions from the participants on appointment as liquidator, if there are no assets, only liabilities, what is the way forward for the liquidator? Um, very unlikely scenario, uh, because if you have no assets, I mean, the company would have some assets for sure. Um, even if it's, you know, under attachment by ED, like for example, in a Gitanjali kind of case, there will certainly be some sort of assets uh, pure liability scenario, I have never really seen in, the, in, in that context. So um, I, I don't think we'll come across that kind of a scenario, but if at all uh, that be the case, there will be no takers. Um, the dues in respect of provident fund, pension fund, gratuity fund, do they form part of the liquidation estate? Uh, no, they do not. Uh, there is a specific exclusion to that effect in IBC. Uh, they stay outside and must be paid because obviously 
uh, for example, pension fund. Uh, they are part typically settle in a trust with uh, uh, the employee provident fund organization or in a private trust which is registered with the provident fund organization. So no, they will not form part of the liquidation estate and to that extent enjoy a super priority in a different way um, because they represent their accrued income, which is which cannot be clawed back into the corporate data. Um, can the liquidator compel a creditor to relinquish its security interests? Um, I think that's at least to my mind, no, because um, I mean, there are two answers to it. One, of course, a liquid a, a creditor chooses to relinquish his security interest and remain outside the liquidation process or chooses to be in the process. Um, it's not something that the liquidator can 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 really tell him to do or not to do. Of course, if he does not give his list of security regulation 21 A, I think provides uh, a timeline within which it has to be done. Otherwise, presume that he has relinquished in favor of liquidation estate. Um, any other questions in this or or if there are any other thoughts, happy to hear that. I think we can close now. Uh, okay. So